Good afternoon. Owen Mitchell, HSBC and Sheffield Hallam University are delighted to welcome you to this event on embracing sustainability in manufacturing and we're so pleased you can join us today. Um, my name is Dorian Peters, I'm a commercial litigation partner at Owen Mitchell and the head of our multidisciplinary manufacturing sector group. Um, I previously qualified as an engineer, then as a lawyer, and now I have the privilege to lead a, a fantastic team of lawyers who help our manufacturing clients across the country and across um, the sectors and sectors. Um, sustainability is an increasingly important topic in many industries at the moment. Manufacturers have the real crucial issues to consider with regard to um, sustainability, including how, how and where they obtain their materials from, how they utilise and potentially minimise their energy in the manufacturing processes, uh, dealing with the waste created by those processes and how they distribute and engage with their supply chains. The manufacturing industry therefore has a prominent role to play in the drive for a more sustainable society, potentially carbon neutrality and the hope and we really hope that this webinar is the beginning of that journey for some and also helps you in your journey for others. And before I hand over to my colleagues, um, a few housekeeping matters. Um, that some of you have already submitted questions. We've got those on a list. We will come to those at the end of the um, speaker slots. Uh, you may submit additional questions using the Q&A function uh, and we will log those and see if we can get to them in the time we have for questions. In the event that you that we run out of time, if you submit your name and your email address along with your question, we will do what we can to directly respond to that and give you an answer um, in due course. Uh, we will be recording this event for future consumption by obviously yourselves and also others who are interested. Um, and towards the end of the session, we will be also posting a feedback link. Please take some time just to give us some feedback so we can um, make uh, our seminar presentations in the future relevant to your, you and your businesses. Now, um, I'd like to introduce you to Andy Richardson from HSBC. Thank you. Thanks, Dorian. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Andy Richardson, uh, a relationship director at HSBC in the Sheffield and Humber region. I hope you're looking forward to this afternoon session as much as I am. Uh, so HSBC's role here is that of relationship banker to business. We seek to be net zero as an organisation by 2030 and by 2050 for its entire portfolio, i.e. including our client base. In recent years, being sustainable was seen as an additional cost, a choice, but consumers are changing now. However, many corporates will wait for the legislative push before taking action. Others will see the wider supply chain benefits of having an improved ESG outlook in everyday activities. So food for thought is, do we all lead on this or do we just follow? I hope you enjoy the event this afternoon and I'd like to, ha like to hand over to Claire Patricia Riding at Irwin Mitchell. Hi everyone. Um, so hopefully the, the slide will just uh, move on now. Um, so these are the things that I'm going to just be t briefly touching upon. Um, it's an exciting year for environmental practitioners um, because we are expecting the introduction of the Environment Bill. Um, uh, that really gives us a context of something to talk about at the moment um, in respect of some of the issues that are coming out um, of, the, of the government this year. Um, it does feed back from, sorry, it, it follows on from what happened last year with Boris Johnson making uh, the Green Industrial Revolution uh, 10 point plan. So some of these issues um, are fed into the Environment Bill. Um, some of these issues are something that we need to consider when we are advising clients about how they can achieve their or start their journey to net zero and how they can achieve net zero um, within the specified time frame. Um, and also how um, this also feeds into that ESG uh, golden thread. So um, the Environment Bill um, it is currently making its uh, way through the House of Lords at the moment. Um, there's been a lot of press about it. And this is a flagship bill by the, um, by the government. It's very wide ranging and it has four priority areas, which are air, water, um, waste and resource uh, management and biodiversity. And really what it's trying to do is um, set 
uh, legally binding targets on each of those uh, areas um, for um, development, uh, for manufacturing, for different types of sectors that all have uh, an emissions data um, set that it can capture um, by actually then bringing forward those le legally binding targets as to how they can uh, be managed. So, for example, for air quality, um, we're looking at the clean air strategy um, and really what particulate matter uh, number is, is, is uh, acceptable to be achieved. Um, it will set a legally binding target, um, it will bring in clean air zones and it's something that we are already uh, looking at when we are um, dealing with city centre um, uh, clean air zones. In terms of water, um, this is, um, as you can see on the picture, um, this is really to, to protect and enhance the water environment that we have um, within uh, the United Kingdom. Um, it's going to set water quality targets, um, again, um, very similar to the Water Framework Directive that um, uh, was uh, led by the, the EU uh, legislation. Um, but obviously it's just bringing forward that transition period um, into uh, that framework. Again, for resource and, and waste management, it's trying to reduce and, re and reuse as much material as possible. A ban on single use uh, plastics and a ban on uh, exporting certain types of waste um, are expected. Um, and again, for biodiversity, um, that's already been um, pretty much set in stone um, that the government are hoping to achieve a 10% net gain um, of biodiversity. And the critical um, point there, um, or the sticking point that's been discussed recently, is about whether the biodiversity net gain. Um, initiative should touch on large major infrastructure projects um, and there has been um, a, a confirmation that that will be uh, brought into um, uh, the biodiversity net gain target which is actually really significant. So these are the four um, key areas of the environment bill. Um, we have no targets yet so um, there will be um, a lot of consultation that's going to happen they, they say this summer, I know it's checking it down with rain here today, but uh, we are technically in uh, British summertime. Um, so uh, I don't know when they're going to, to be likely, um, but we are expecting them uh, soon. And if it's not throughout the summer, it will be into the autumn. And then that feeds into the planning reform uh, that uh, uh, Robert Jenrick, uh, the Secretary of State for um, Homes and Local Government has uh, been recently quoted on as well. Um, and this all uh, feeds into um, how we can bring forward um, our net zero transition, so 78% reduction of carbon emissions by 2035, um, as we bring in the sixth climate budget from the Climate Change Committee. And how do we do that? Well, if we already uh, try to achieve the targets in the Environment Bill, that would be a big step forward. But also how we can look at how we manage and uh, uh, use energy, um, both in the manufacturing sector, but also how we heat our homes and our buildings. Um, uh, we have, uh, the, as I said, the Green Industrial Revolution and the 10 point plan that was announced in October last year. Um, separate to that, we also have local authorities. Um, they, 75% uh, of which have made a climate change declaration. Um, and they will have adopted policies. Um, so if you are looking at expanding your facilities or coming forward with new facilities in certain areas, it's something to look out for whether a local planning authority does have a climate change declaration, because that will um, alter what you or may alter what you can and can't do. And if it has any stringent requirements as to how you manage your emissions going forward. Um, We've also seen recently climate change uh, litigation uh, where we've had uh, some, uh, some decisions in relation to uh, carbon emissions from uh, certain organisations um, and how uh, the, the courts are reacting to those stated policies of, of organisations. So it is also something to look out for where we are um, seeing campaign groups holding those organisations to account. 
And again, ESG is a thread that runs throughout all of this um, and how you look at your investments um, uh, portfolio and how you obtain investments in respect of uh, your key uh, infrastructure projects. So that's a real whistle stop tour of environment matters and I will hand over now to Hugh Jones. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so hello everybody, uh, thanks for attending today. Uh, my job here is to introduce you to uh, Sheffield Hallam University's research strategy, uh, show you where our research focus is and give you some examples of where we are applying our expertise uh, for the development of sustainability in lots of different areas. Next slide, please. So our research strategy is made up of a number of different aspects and um, the three on the top and left hand side are more about how it links to our students on our teaching agenda and our ambition to be in a, the world's leading applied university. The ones I really wanted to talk about today, the aspects of our strategy are about collaboration and about emerging challenges and how that links as well to multidisciplinary projects. So a lot of what we do is collaborative. Um, we've always done this. We're a very applied university. Uh, we collaborate internally, which is very important across the different research centres. We're very strong in the region in terms of collaborating uh, with regional companies, for example, but also local governments and so on. But we shouldn't um, ignore the fact that we collaborate nationally and internationally um, with some very major organisations and governments and so on. Um, that brings me on to who actually. So we collaborate with other universities, as you'd expect us to but extensively with a wide range of companies, including lots of SMEs and large organisations. But we also collaborate with governments and government departments from the UK and different countries. And we also engage with and involve the public in some areas of our research. In terms of what we focus on, um, it's defined as emerging challenges, but for the purposes of what we're talking about today, we're really talking about post pandemic recovery, climate change, environmental regulation, the aspects of the limitation of resources that is uh, now on the agenda, which is linked, of course, to the circular economy, how we make the most of what we already have. And of course, um, future health issues um, for both an aging population and post pandemic, of course. Next slide, please. So our current strategy, which as all good strategies uh, are, is currently being reviewed and will change soon. But at the moment, we have three research platforms into which we like to seek to have all our research taking place and they are enabling healthier lives uh, for current and emerging health challenges. They are building stronger communities where we work towards a safer, prosperous um, society with uh, inclusion for all. And the one that's probably most relevant today to this audience is driving future economies where we are innovating to drive the recovery and future growth in the face of what let's face it, are going to be profound changes. Next slide, please. So there, that was our platforms, but internally we are organised into four major research institutes, um, which you can see here, creative and cultural research, health research, industry and innovation, which is where I sit, and social and economic research. Um, so there are representatives, I think, from most of these areas, with the possible exception of health here today. Um, but we can give you an overview. But of course, these don't stand on their own. And as you can see from the platforms, most of our research kind of reaches across these areas and involves multidisciplinary teams. OK, next slide, please. So just to focus on one and the one is probably most relevant to today, and that's the Industry and Innovation Research Institute. It has four major um, research groupings within it what we call MERI, the Materials and Engineering Research Institute, that's me and where I come from, the National Centre for Excellence in Food Engineering, uh, Biomolecular Research Centre, BMRC, and one which we won't hear much about today, but it's very important still, is the Centre for Excellence in Terrorism, Resilience, Intelligence and Organised Crime Research, otherwise known as CENTRIC. Um, so you can see even within one research institute, we have multiple disciplines which uh, work together where the projects require it. Next slide, please. Now, apologies for the, the wording here. It's more of a prompt for me really to tell you about what we do. So we have a, a large group working on glasses and ceramics. 
So the kind of thing we look at here are high performance materials, for example, or the sustainability of the manufacturing process for the manufacturing of glasses and ceramics. And that might include um, glasses for packaging, ceramics for ceramic armor, or ceramics, for example, for bricks and roof tiles, that kind of thing. We have a group focusing on polymers and composites, uh, where the main aim is to look at lightweight, functional, biomedical, and possibly fireproof materials. We look at metals and alloys, where we look at high strength steels, materials which resist wear and decorative alloys. So that's things like silver alloys and other decorative materials. We have a very strong group looking at thin films, which includes coatings, which can be used for uh, wear resistance, corrosion resistance in biomedical implant applications, but also for things like sensors and solar materials. Uh, a group looking at an understanding corrosion, its detection, how you prevent it, how you test and analyze for it. We have uh, research projects and people looking at infrastructure, and by that I mean the built infrastructure. So for example, bridges, concrete bridges and their reinforcements, but also steel for um, rail infrastructure, for example. We have uh, groups look, which uh, do modeling, and of course that's a very broad topic, and it goes across from fluids, the flow of heat, the modeling of materials themselves, or the modeling of industrial processes. A group looking at robotics, Artificial intelligence, of course, is important there, machine vision, and things like swarm robotics, where you can have autonomous firefighting swarms of robots. We have a group looking at energy, um, and that's really thermal energy, of course, but other forms of energy, such as energy generation, other aspects of energy generation, um, the recovery of heat, and the modeling of thermal processes. And across all of those areas, we also run consultancy, where when it's not really an R&D project, uh, you can come to us and we will work with you on specific, relatively short term projects on a consultancy basis. Next slide, please. We do all this because we have excellent equipment and laboratories as well as excellent staff. Um, so in the laboratories, we can make stuff, to put it simply, so we can make new ceramics, new glasses, new formulations. We can fire them. We have furnaces and so on. We can make and blend new polymer composites. Or we can make new coatings, new sensor materials and stuff like that. Once we've done that, the, the other thing we do is to analyze uh, what's been made or we analyze materials that have come from industry. And we do that across a very broad range of equipment and techniques, including my electron microscopy, a wide range of spectroscopic techniques, thermal analysis, where we look at what materials do when they're heated up or cool down. Um, we look specifically at coatings and thin films to see um, how they perform. We can test materials and structures, so we can test bits of material, individual components or entire concrete beams, for example. We can test those structures and materials in an environmental way. So what I mean by that is, you know, what happens when they get hot, cold, humid, wet, when they corrode, things like that. And where experiments are too difficult or too expensive, we can model things. We can model how things should behave uh, using a cluster of PCs and special software. Next slide, please. So we bring all that together and we do that and we apply that to uh, projects mostly with industry. And these are some sort of anonymized projects which we um, carry out. Um, so my colleagues later will give you some detail into some of these, for example, but I want to just go through them in a, in a sort of generic way, tell you the sort of things we do. So um, when we're looking at using less energy in the manufacturing process, that might be through the capture of waste heat and its reuse but it might be through the modification of materials so that they don't need to be fired to as high a temperature. And that could, of course, give you very large savings on your gas bill, for example, if you're making bricks or ceramics. Um, we can make those production processes more efficient. And by that, an example of that is, for example, having longer lasting tooling. So if your tooling lasts twice as long, you have much less waste, your process is more efficient. Um, or you might use new, newly developed sensors to get better control over your process, particularly thermal processes, so that you can, again, can make it more efficient. We do work to make products themselves last longer. So that may, might be making products which have, um, which wear out less quickly, or they might have a lower corrosion rate. They might not suffer, for example, from fatigue, or they might have a higher temperature capability, all of which would make those products last longer in service. Not just um, uh, consumer goods, but you know, industrial goods and industrial machinery. Um, we might help companies make products that are more efficient in their use. 
So those might be materials which are lighter weight or, for example, have better strength to weight ratios. And I'm thinking of um, very high strength steels. So you use the same amount of steel, but you actually um, it has higher strength. Um, we also do projects where we look at the use or reducing the use of virgin resources. So it's anything that you might mine or take out of the ground. Um, how do we reduce that? Well, primarily by using something else, usually another waste stream. Um, and we are we have several projects which look at that kind of approach for using waste streams instead of new raw materials. Next slide, please. And finally, we might be looking at entirely new products to meet new challenges. And an example there is the sort of catalyst that you need in order to generate, in order to make hydrogen for the potential hydrogen economy of the future or making new materials or testing new materials for use in energy storage applications such as new battery materials. There are also projects we do which look at future challenges and I mentioned the hydrogen economy again here. Uh, there's a particular challenge here in that switching to hydrogen changes what you need your processes to do and what they need to tolerate. And this might mean generating or sorry, inventing or making new materials, new insulation materials, new uh, materials for piping and welding techniques so that we can safely store hydrogen, which comes with its own particular challenges. And something that's been mentioned already, and that is increasing an awareness of the raw materials resources. And that's among both manufacturers and consumers. So it's about project which reach out and uh, excuse me and tell people about where things like nickel and chromium come from, molybdenum, and tantalum. We've got you know, stories about blood minerals here, um, the resource limitations around lithium for new batteries, the recycling of gold from e-waste and so on. Uh, there are very major challenges here, both in terms of environmental and just resource availability. So we're doing that as well. Next slide, please. That's it from me. Um, I'm happy to answer questions later if you want to log them in the chat. But next you'll hear from my colleague um, Mark Phillips, who is going to give you some examples, I believe, about how design and the work we do on design um, has an impact on the sustainability agenda. Mark. Thanks, Hal. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Phillips. I'm design director of Design Futures, which is a product and packaging design and innovation group based at Sheffield Hallam. Um, and as Hal said, I'm going to talk about appropriate product design and how that can bring sustainability benefits and deliver better products. Um, next slide, please. So Design Futures is, is about innovation. That Our aim is to try and find new and better ways of doing things that might be more efficient uh, ways. Two broad types of activity that we use for uh, achieving innovation. Firstly, it's exploration. So that's kind of open-minded questioning of current practice, uh, researching and insight gathering, that kind of thing, and asking what should we be doing? Um, and these kinds of insights drive innovation. And the second part is realisation, so applying those tools within a structured um, new product development process. And that could include things and does uh, things like eco design and applying circular economy principles within design for manufacture. Um, we work with lots of different organisational scales, so SMEs right through to large multinationals and across many different sectors. And um, there's some examples on there of projects that blend sustainability with business benefits. So there's a mattress on there that's much more comfortable than the previous generation, but uses 60% less foam and a flat pack medical product that's easy to use, but reduces the physical volume that's shipped around the place uh, by 95%. So um, what I'd like to do now is share some uh, more details, uh, sorry, more detailed examples with you about where responsible design improves sustainability and creates opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. So this first one is a bit highlights the importance of challenging conventional approaches. Um, we're working with the uh, with Unilever's core innovation team, um, which which was about trying to aim for less energy and less water. So the the two uh, projects are linked there. The first one top left is about showering in sub-Saharan Africa. And the question there was, can we use solar heating and less water rather than grid electricity 
um, to reduce environmental impact, but maintain good hygiene and a good user experience. And it's that combination of technology and user um, experience that, that we're trying to, uh, to, to blend. Um, and we did that with looking at water flow and volumization techniques. The second one was about low water. So we don't want to ship water around the world or the better ways of doing it. And the question is, what if soap wasn't in bottles or, or bars or sachets? What might it be like? And what emerged from that was, was a new range of, of products where um, that, could, that worked well, but also excited and engaged users. So innovation starts with questioning what's happening and, and placing the user at the centre of the experience. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how, showing how design can be applied at a product level. So this is a nurse call handset. It's, it's just been released, although we did top left is the one we did previously, uh, many years ago actually, uh, but still use the same sort of principles of, of eco design and sustainability. Um, but within that, it's optimised functional design, so it's durable, um, but we also designed it so it visually wouldn't date, so it's got visual longevity. Um, and the, the image at the bottom there is about the cable assembly, so cables inevitably get damaged in hospitals. Um, and what this offers is the, the opportunity for NHS to replace that part whilst not disturbing the, uh, the waterproofing on the main assembly. So that's a benefit to hospitals. Um, it's a revenue stream for the company in terms of um, a consumable. But what it's done is it's given them a strong sustainability argument to win tenders and a high product, a high quality product. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, this is an example of how design can support a product service system. So this is like a leased product rather than something you, you own uh, necessarily. Um, but the point here is Lodog's, Lodog's idea was to create a durable plastic pallet and use it many times rather than using um, uh, stretch wrap plastic once as a single use, which is a great idea. And our role was involved in the human factors, the ergonomics and uh, the form design to help make this product easier and quicker to use than what, what went before it. So that they're delivering substantial sustainability benefits, but also user benefits and benefits to the companies. And that's gone on to create a thriving business um, and many more products have, have followed since then. Um, next slide, please. That's everything from me. Um, thank you for listening. And if there's any uh, um, anyone interested in applying design uh, within your business to drive sustainable innovation, uh, please do get in touch. I'll now hand you over to David. David, if you'd like to come in. Hello, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Good afternoon. Um, so my name's David Clegg. And for the past decade or so, we've been working with a number of clients to improve both Lean and Six Sigma, and thereby reducing the amount of waste and resources which are needlessly consumed. For me, my Lean journey started not in the usual manufacturing sector, but within healthcare, specifically Rotherham Hospital, where I was seconded for a year. The reason for taking this unusual approach to learning Lean was that I wanted to better understand both how to reduce waste and how the techniques track and, and if they transcend sectors. Having broadened my understanding of the tools and techniques, I brought this new knowledge back to the university and began to teach both Lean and Six Sigma and engage with local companies through knowledge transfer partnership schemes. You may have heard of them as the abbreviation KTPs. The first KTP that I did was with Evenort, a subsea flange manufacturing company on the outskirts of Sheffield. The second was with PMS Diecasting, a supplier of Gripple. In both cases, recent Hallam graduates were hired and through mentoring, they spent 18 months successfully transforming these factories. And in both cases, the graduates went on to become full-time employees. With Oscar, the student at PMS Diecasting, becoming the production manager. The two of the product, 
projects on the right hand side of the screen again utilize the knowledge and understanding of our undergraduate and postgraduate students improving production rates increasing quality while reducing waste within the manufacturing processes in the case of jepson russell the student went on to be work for them after graduating thereby fully embedding the lean principles within the business in all cases lean projects involve an element of educating the workforce co-developing value stream maps highlighting opportunities for improvement and ultimately implementing the suggestions which the workforce make and it's very important that those suggestions come from the workforce if we are to embed the changes next slide please This slide is a very pictorial illustration of before and after implementing 6S. In this case, it was in the Rotherham Health Store, Rotherham Hospital's stores. The work formed part of a larger mapping exercise, which ultimately saw four stores consolidated into one main store and two smaller satellite stores. The improvement in the layout and co-locating consumables reduced not only the time required to find parts, but also the number of parts which were out of stock. Next slide, please. So in terms of resources, what do we have within the Department of Engineering and Maths? Well, we have about 700 students, all of whom are looking to apply their learning within their course to industrially based problems. For our second year students, the problems that we like them to tackle are between January and May. And this past year, the students have tackled problems relating to um, how to improve and outline potential solutions to local businesses. For the coming academic year, we would like our third year students to engage more greater depth with um, our local collaborators so that ultimately our students can design more efficient processes and products. In relation to Lean, we have approximately 170 MSc logistics and supply chain students, all of whom would like to apply waste reduction techniques with an industrial partner. And this is something which we'd like you to consider doing with us. And finally, both our MSc undergraduate and postgraduate students do and have the opportunity to complete a work placement with an organisation, be it 24 weeks for the postgraduates or a year for the undergraduates, where they can come to your businesses and hopefully start the process of reducing waste within your business. Now, if I could please pass you on to John Grant, who will take the next section. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide, please. If I could reintroduce, please, John Grant. Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry there. Uh, a bit of a, a bit of a glitch there on my part. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for the double introduction. It honestly wasn't anything to do with my ego. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, so I'm I'm in the construction area. This is my contact details, and here's the the problem that we're in a an emergency now, and we have to make a, a change really significantly over the the the, the next. Uh, few years uh, and it has to be absolutely huge and we have to stop making mistakes because you know this kind of cut is 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 absolutely essential the last seven years have been the warmest seven years ever and and we really haven't got the time to to, to you know to come up with the the better mousetrap if you would um you know it, it's it's just not the time but the good news is that the research that we are are carrying out both here 
and in conjunction with the local authority uh, allow us to sort of make this change that over the next five years uh, the, the the Sheffield City Council is pushing very hard for, for zero carbon within the city by 2030 uh, and here at Sheffield Hallam we are, are working very hard with a carbon literacy sort of upgrading of people's knowledge is associated with that um, to, to change the narrative that this isn't a compromise, that when we begin our action, when we begin changing what we do, we as a university have already come up with the solutions and, and our research, it isn't what we're going to do in the future, it's what we've actually done. And, and the issue is now about rolling that out and, and to establish what can be done and what can't be done. And, and in the construction industry, this is especially sort, sort of relevant in that we are continuing because we're just following a sort of a standard of making mistakes, even though as a university, we know what is required and we come up with the, the, the ways of, of, of kind of doing that. So, you know, we, we, we can, as a university, we're, we're able to create this, this imagine, this, not an imaginary world, but a future world that could exist. And why do I know it could exist? Because we've already done the research, especially in construction, you know, over the last quarter of a century, we've established zero carbon homes. We've established resilient homes that, that you know, we can deliver at cost and we have an agenda that we have researched and the, the game now, the, all, all the game is, is how do we roll this out effectively? And it's about communications as far as I'm concerned, the, the, about taking this forwards, about, about using our authority because these zero carbon homes can create a better life, a better way of doing that. And this is just one small area, you know, we can produce them at density, at the sufficient density to deliver our needs because, you know, we are at a moment here that if we don't take what we've done right and roll it forwards so that we're doing the right thing, then, you know, it's going to get very, very serious. And and I don't want to be part of that, especially since things could be better. And, and I'm terribly sorry because I, I had it on timing there, so we've gone on. So, um, I'd like to now pass on to Paul Bingham. We're a little bit behind, but I've been a bit quick there. So over to you. Um, thanks. Bye. Thank you very much, John. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've just got three slides and um, I'll talk very briefly through them and hopefully help uh, get us back on track as well. So so I work in the area of glasses and ceramics and um, our, our research really is based in, in, in four topical areas. The first being the relationships between how a material is processed and its chemical composition, what it's made up of, the structure, so how those components are fitted together at every level from atoms upwards through to the properties, how the material behaves. And that really defines materials and science and engineering, how materials perform in service. We also work on industrial energy and CO2 reduction and resource efficiency, uh, which ties back into something that Howell talked about earlier. And of course, advanced materials and manufacturing from tiny little uh, items for uh, hermetic sealing all the way up to large sort of um, uh, construction type materials. And finally, waste management. I, I've, I've put radioactive and toxic waste here, but it also includes non-toxic waste or byproducts or better still, things we can reuse as part of a circular economy approach. Um, we have a diverse portfolio of funding, which is very important in the modern world. And don't put all your eggs in one basket. So our funding comes from a very wide range of sources uh, from the UK, outside the UK, transatlantic and direct industrial funding. And uh, some of the numbers there in indicate the kinds of, of uh, size of projects that we're working on. We have a very, very wide range of international partnerships with a range of universities all over the world. Um, and in particular, we have a, a very wide range of industrial partnerships. And these range from micro SMEs, um, five minutes walk away from the university, all the way up to large multinationals and everything in between. And a couple of companies that are mentioned there, uh, I'll, I'll touch on in my, my next slides. Um, 
importantly, we have a very diverse research group as well. Um, I was looking at the numbers and we have six different countries, the UK, India, China, Ghana, Iran, Turkey, and we have almost parity uh, on a gender balance. Not quite, but for science and engineering, we're, we're quite pleased with that because it gives us an incredible diversity to what we do. And that's vitally important in, uh, in the modern world. Next slide, please. OK, um, so a couple of examples of, of our innovation and how we've helped uh, industry. So the first is uh, looking at glass and I've got two examples here. Um, the top one is uh, briquetting. Now, most of you know briquettes from barbecues. You go to the petrol station, and you buy a big bag of charcoal briquettes. Well, these aren't quite the same. What we've been doing is taking the 20 percent of glass that you put into your bottle bank that cannot be recycled. Currently it's thrown away or used in building roads. And we've been forming those into briquettes which can then be reintroduced into a glass making furnace and thereby save substantial amounts of energy and CO2. And this has been uh, developed all the way through to trial uh, and it has won multiple awards at national and European level by our DAR group with whom we've been working on this. The second one is, it go, again goes back to something Howell mentioned earlier about using waste derived byproducts and raw materials to make things like glasses and ceramics. And um, as you'll hear later, there have been a, a number of projects in which we've been involved in uh, in this regard. Um, you may notice the photo there of Drax. We are currently working with Drax and many other partners on a project looking at byproducts that come out of their process and trying to make things like glass out of them. And there's a photo at the bottom of your screen that shows some of the, uh, the glasses that we've made using Drax Ash. Next slide, please. And finally, um, we've also worked with uh, a large multinational company called Morgan Advanced Materials, and we helped them uh, solve uh, some critical issues uh, during their development activities, which have advanced a new biosoluble um, insulation material which is non carcinogenic and replaces the current industry standard, which is. And that's been uh, developed all the way through to full scale commercial manufacture and it's now on the market. Uh, it also gives improvements in insulating properties at, at the same time. So there's a, a nice, very brief <laughs> overview of a couple of things we've done at multiple technology readiness levels, all the way from the lab right through to commercial implementation. So I'll now hand over to Anthony Davis, who's going to talk about ways of working with SHU. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Anthony Davis, uh, and I'm going to run through a few different mechanisms that we have uh, of uh, working with our industry partners. So if we can move on to the first slide, please. So firstly, we've got some funding programmes which allow us to work with businesses at no cost to the business, which is always a good thing. And these are the Digital uh, Innovation for Growth programme and the Sheffield Innovation programme. And both of these are specifically uh, for Sheffield City region businesses, uh, which I think the majority of, of uh, those companies on the call are, are based in Sheffield City region. So it's, that's the whole of South Yorkshire. North East Derbyshire, Chesterfield, Bassett Law, Derbyshire Dales, um, balls over. And these programmes are specific to SMEs. And again, I, don't, I know everyone on this call isn't necessarily an SME, but certainly a number of you are. And the definition that we work to is a European definition, and that's companies with fewer than 250 full-time equivalent staff and a turnover uh, less than 43 million pounds or 50 million euros. So it, it covers quite a, a, a wide range of businesses. And what these programmes do is allow us to work with businesses that have a specific technical challenge or problem that can't be solved, uh, or they can't solve on their own and they need the in input of academic experts and maybe access to our, our research facilities as well. Uh, and typical examples, you've already heard of some of the types of things that we can, we can work on, improving production efficiencies, reducing wastage, uh, increasing lifespan of, of tooling and materials, um, the introduction of digital uh, innovation, Internet of Things, technologies and so on. And through these programmes, typically um, we can deliver projects up to 10 days worth or, or 10 days of an academic's time, but 
we do have examples where we've worked with companies and provided up to 25 or 30 days of academic consultancy to those businesses. Uh, and it's also worth noting that um, by the end of the year, um, we will have a new testing, imaging and characterization centre um, coming online, uh, which will focus on developing uh, bio and advanced materials, uh, which will also uh, provide some uh, services for which fully funded services for SMEs again in the Sheffield City region. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, we can look at some other mechanisms which are not SME specific, that apply to all companies that uh, come into contact with us. And uh, David spoke uh, briefly about knowledge transfer partnerships, which, which are a national programme enabling businesses to access funding and expertise for support uh, for strategic projects, which will stimulate innovation through knowledge transfer. And in terms of the structure of a KTP, they're, they're funded by Innovate UK and there are three key players or partners involved in the KTP. There's, there's you as a business, there's us as a university and knowledge base, and then there's the actual KTP associate. And this is the graduate, a relatively recent graduate, somebody that, that we recruit nationally, it's not necessarily one of our own, who we employ to work in your business specifically on, on, on this strategic innovation related project, but they have regular structured and formal contact with uh, academics in the university within the knowledge base so that uh, technology is transferred into uh, the businesses. And typically projects last one to three years, depending uh, on the size of your business, you can receive funding uh, between 50 and 67 percent. And so the actual cost to the business might be somewhere between 30 to 50 K per year, but, but that very much depends on the nature of, of your project. Collaborative research is another way to work with us, and this is most commonly undertaken with grant funding. Um, Innovate UK is one of the main uh, players in this funding. Smart awards are, are, are one which you may have, uh, have heard of, and, and they, they cover activity from feasibility work through to experimental development stages. They don't cover commercialization activities. And typically projects there might, might range from 25K to 3 million, depending on the size and stage of the R&D uh, that you're at, uh, will determine how, how much of a grant you can get. But between 25% and 60% is, is, is that sort of funding regime, as I say, depending on uh, the nature of the project and the size of your organization. We also obviously will work with businesses uh, on commercial consulting contract R&D, uh, which are relatively similar types of activity, um, which would have a, an academic lead to address the particular objective or project and challenge that, that you want us to deal with. And in, in most cases, the, the outputs, uh, the intellectual property generated would be owned by you as, as a business. Contract R&D tends to be a little longer term and more in depth than the consultancy, but, it, but in both cases, um, projects are considered and costed on a, on a case by case basis. Uh, and such projects can, can then lead to, to development of larger um, joint bids for, for other uh, innovation and R&D funds, which will then potentially um, move into a collaborative R&D project. And, it, and, and Dave also touched earlier on um, undergraduates and postgraduate opportunities. So we've got such a broad range of offers in that area from, from sponsoring a PhD student right the way down through to you know, short term um, internships and, and work placements. And, and some of those uh, are, are available to businesses at no cost, but, but obviously in other cases, you know, the, uh, the, the, the intern or, or, the, or the work placement would of course be expected to receive some sort of reimbursement. And so final slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what are the benefits of working with um, Sheffield Home University? Uh, well, working with us and especially um, developing a long-term relationship with us uh, establishes uh, close academic contacts uh, who will have a, a much deeper understanding of your needs as a business and your objectives. Uh, it can help to uh, create a pathway of communication which will allow us to keep you appraised of technical and state-of-the-art developments that are likely to be of interest and benefit to, to your, your, your sector, your industry. Um, there will be the construct of a tried and tested model uh, 
uh, for working together, which makes the life much more straightforward in terms of planning and executing the project and, and setting up um, the contracting processes and so on. And, and, and you, you get access to you know, much wider university resources, the, the events, uh, other uh, resources and, and training, CPD management, leadership programs and so on. And so what we'd really want to do is to encourage you to stay in touch with us, develop those long term relationships. Um, many of our academic departments and groups uh, look for industry partners to join their advisory boards. So that's a really a uh, good way of, of developing strong relationships. Under normal circumstances, we would love and encourage you to come and look around the, the research uh, facilities that we've got and, and look at all the kit. Clearly, that's a little bit more, more difficult at the moment, but uh, once, once we're in a position to do that, then we'd certainly welcome you to come down and do that. And as well as all of those that are on the call today, uh, each of our research institutes, the four research institutes that were mentioned earlier, has a dedicated innovation manager and they're a key point of, in, of contact for industry. So again, uh, we, we have dedicated points of contact. We also have a dedicated business gateway portal as well. And you know, all our contact details are, are, have been shown uh, at the beginning of the presentation. So, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce you to the next speaker, who is Graham Jones of C-Probe Systems Limited. And I think Graham's going to talk to you about his experiences working with the company or with the university. Hello everybody, I'm Graham Jones. I'm CEO of CPRO Group. I, we operate in St Helens and Merseyside and I've been working with the Merry Group at SHU since 2010. So quite a, quite a long relationship now and it's been very successful both in the way we operate our business but also to the value of our business. Let me tell you what we do. Next slide. We prevent this from happening very simply. Uh, it's a tragic uh, accident, a uh, 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 collapse of the Miami building not so long ago last week and the New York Times pre-engineering report I would add have attributed this potentially to uh, the uh, lack of maintenance and lack of corrosion repairs. As a business we are corrosion specialists. Next slide. So we monitor and control corrosion in buildings and in infrastructure and we've been doing that since the early 90s. Uh, we began by adding embedded sensors, uh, developing open network electronics, online server to uh, remotely access data and control covered protection systems, as well as to monitor and address the performance of other uh, treatments uh, and membranes and the likes. Uh, so it's uh, non-structure specific, it's relevant to all, and we have a, a long track record, which I'll come to. Next slide. We do this with three basic pieces of our uh, offering. The first one is where we concentrated our efforts with uh, SHU and uh, used their uh, platform development for 15 years or so and by 2010 in uh, alkali activated cementitious materials. Uh, that allowed us to uh, progress uh, our uh, research into uh, low carbon cementitious anodes. Uh, we also have uh, formulations and mixed designs for non-anode materials. But our specific USP is in taking a, a cement, making it hard, obviously, by like alkali activating it, and when hardened, it acts as an anode for cathodic protection, which is very unique. Uh, with that, we vertically sell our sensors, for uh, embedded sensors for monitoring the performance of such systems uh, and to the control networks to assess performance uh, ongoing, which is done offline, uh, online, uh, on the internet where we can remotely control the systems as well as access data and, and provide reports to clients. Next slide. It's, it's not a small issue. Uh, this data comes from the National Association of Corrosion Engineers in America where they've estimated that 70% of all infrastructure damage is due to corrosion. So it's the primary cause of problems. It's also the least issue that's addressed by structural engineers uh, and it needs to uh, elevate in its profile. Next slide. Because the benefit as estimated by the same people in the US, if, if they put control systems into structures, the economy would save $850 billion per year. How that translates to the UK? Well, it's almost exactly the same percentage of effect on GDP. 
3.4% of GDP could be saved if control systems were put in place rather than ignoring uh, the effects of corrosion. So the money's there to be saved, the technology is there to do the job. Next slide. Federal highways in America uh, recognize third protection as the only technique that can stop corrosion. So it's not as if uh, there are multiple ways of doing this. This is the technique that's tested and proven since the mid 70s with different types of anode systems. The difference now is we can make the concrete the actual anode, which makes a huge difference. Next slide. So think of it as a structural pacemaker, if you like, where the hardened anode is placed into the structure either in a, a chase in the concrete for retrofitting or in a drill hole or sprayed, uh, or as we're developing now, a molded component part that can be connected directly to the reinforcement prior to placement of concrete. So in the precast factory or on site in situ casting. And what that does is allow us the ability to pass a current through that anode, through the concrete to the steel. And if we turn the steel into a cathode, it cannot corrode electrochemically or if you like in nature. Cathodes don't corrode. Once we take that data and we have the ability to control that current, then we can control the lifespan of the structure and extend its life. Next slide. If we take this example, this is uh, the old uh, Terry's Chocolate Factory in New York, a project that we completed a couple of years ago. And when we arrived there, the uh, intent from the developer was to convert the chocolate factory into 180 high-end apartments, add some value, 50 million pounds of development. After, we, uh, after they restored it, made the apartments, during that process, we installed one of our systems uh, and it's now preserved for another century after existing for almost a century prior. So it's very, very long lasting uh, strategy. Move on. Not only that, it saved 90% of the restoration costs against traditional methods, because the tr traditional method for that building was to strip all the brickwork off, clean all the corrosion off the steel, uh, and reconstruct all the brickwork back onto the, the building. And as you saw previously, it's a very big building to do that. That would have, that would have cost 10 times as much as installing and uh, uh, protecting with the cathodic protection system. <clears throat> Next slide. And not only that, it's 100% protected for its whole life. Uh, in this case, a whole extended life of 100 years. Next. So we place our products in three different places. Uh, our main business is in existing structures for retrofit to repair, protect and strengthen structures. I've mentioned the molded part. We're moving into the new build market, uh, extending our uh, manufacturing facility in St. Helens with the molded parts uh, production line. And the third part, which we are looking to license the, our low semi ACM to larger cement companies as a proper disruptive replacement to Portland cement because there is an 84% reduction in CO2 by adopting uh, AACMs and in our case, low SEM. Next slide. This is achieved by repurposing industrial wastes. Secondly, by securing that embodied carbon within the, uh, the structure. Clearly a lot of embodied uh, carbon is lost if it collapses. Uh, and that provides sustainability, but more importantly, future proofing the structure and giving control of its behaviour. Move on. Low SEM, as I mentioned, is 80% lower than uh, Portland cement, but is also 50% lower in CO2 than, the, than our nearest low carbon competitor, which is uh, in this case, Solidia. Uh, that's not to say Solidia's products are not good. Uh, this is just an enhancement of that more. This data came from the MPA Mineral uh, Association and uh, not CPROG's uh, specific data. So it's been looked at outside us by industry uh, to come up with these uh, figures. Next slide. So in all, it has the potential to save gigatons of CO2 we, uh, and a lot of money. Uh, next slide. We can do that because we're not inexperienced at this. We have over 100 structures, but to put it in perspective, there are millions of structures still needing to be preserved. The next sector to look at in this case is certainly the uh, protecting existing infrastructure. And we've received awards both in the US as well as the UK along the way. Uh, and uh, we're up for some more <laughs> right now. So always welcome. Uh, but, uh, but certainly our work is, uh, is well respected and, and recognized prestigiously. Next slide. 
So thank you for listening and I'll hand you over to uh, Marlon Magalens from Glass Technology Services who will explain what she does. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, so I will be presenting the case study number two. Uh, my name is Marlene Magalanes, so I'm working at Glass Technology Services. Next slide, please. I will explain to you who we are. So we are a company formed in 1999. We are independent, commercial and confidential company. So we provide analysis and testing, consultancy and also R&D to the global industry. Uh, so we also work in different sectors. So we work for the glass manufacturing, uh, but also for oil mining and uh, also for uh, the construction sector. We are located in Sheffield. Uh, we have a strong links with industry, the supply chain and the academia. And one of the examples that the strong link is with, is with uh, Sheffield Hallam University. Next slide, please. So my talk will be focused today uh, to the work that we uh, were conducted with Sheffield Hallam. Uh, to develop biomass ash deliver raw materials to reduce the environmental impact of the glass sector. Next slide, please. How all this started? So the motivation started in 2015 uh, with the agreement of reduce the emissions by 40% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. So this means a lot for the glass a sector because we have a big contribution in the emissions. So based on this one, we come together with a uh, Sheffield Hallam. Next slide, please. And we are working uh, with them from 2017 in different projects. So one of the example is EnviroGlass One, where we uh, look at alternative glass raw materials. So in this project, we made different formulation of glasses uh, then, with all the ways that we study in that project, we uh, focus in the next project to study the ash. Uh, so that was in the Envaroglass 2 and Biomash project that finished last year. Uh, actually, so we have one live project that calls uh, Envaro Ash, where we uh, use all the knowledge that we get from the previous project and expand the consortium. And we are not just looking at the glass sector, we also are working with the ceramic and the cement sector. And also we are looking for new secondary raw materials coming from different uh, industrial, like a paper, metals, and chemicals. Next slide, please. I will be going a little bit more deep in the Envaroglass 2 and Biomash project. Uh, so in this slide, I explain you what we have done. So in this project, we use waste from the uh, biomass power plant. We use this like a raw material. We mix with a standard batch raw material. We um, melt this one at lab scale and also a pilot scale. Then, so we made the testing and check what was the effect when we use ash like a raw material. Next slide, please. In this slide, so I show you a model that we use and was developed by Sheffield Hallam. So when we have the different recipes that we develop with ash, so we first check if we are having CO2 savings and then pass to the melting step. So this was a really key tool developed by Sheffield Hallam and helped us in the project. Next slide, please. And in this one, so I, I showed you one of the steps of the Envaroglass 2 biomass project and was really important for us was when we melt uh, different recipes, 50 kilos of glass each time, recipes containing ash and no ash as well, also low melting point glasses, that is really important. And this was done in July 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, so really interesting activity to do at that point. Uh, after obtaining all these glasses, so we compare what happened with the properties and we didn't find a, a different. So that was really good results. Uh, so also we can say that with this new raw material, ash base, so we can uh, decrease the consumption of the, uh, yes, uh, in 70%, also uh, decrease the carbon emissions and also decrease the landfill because this ash 
at present, many quantity of this ash is going to the lime field. So we are doing a lot of progress on this. Next slide, please. So of course, it's good to say what is the benefit to work uh, with Sheffield Hallam University. And you can see that we have collaborated to make significant contributions to the development of weight-based raw material, uh, also with different foundation industry. And one of the things that we always say, Sheffield Hallam is a very active uh, uh, partner to have, and they are active from the starting of the project till the finish, um, like a pro project manager that is really, really important. Uh, so we are always happy to work with them. Uh, also, it's always a exchange of knowledge, a cooperative environment, mutual networking, and a lot of opportunity. After a project finish, we are always working to see the future, and Sheffield Halland is a key partner there. Also, I would like to say that we have seven years uh, uh, holding uh, students, placement students, and I want to say that this is a win-to-win -win, uh, thing, and I will say all the companies that are listening to this, uh, please go for that. So be in contact with Sheffield Hall uh, to have students that is, is really, really interesting. And the, let's, the next slide. So these are my contacts in case you have any question with the thing that I have explained today. So please contact me or in the section of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marlin, and thank you to all the speakers for your um, insightful comments about um, the things that our manufacturing clients uh, should be focusing on in their drive towards supporting a more sustainable future and also meeting inevitably the regulations that will come down the track to hopefully encourage or maybe even force um, you to comply and achieve that. We've had a few questions, obviously still accepting them if anybody has any further, but I'll start with one question which is a alongside and thinks about the political um, issues that are driving the topic of carbon offset. Um, the question asks, uh, what are the implications and what might be the effects of potential future um, political policy decisions uh, and how might they change um, the current carb carbon offset arrangements and how can I prepare for them? Uh, sounds that sounds like a question for Claire. Uh, thanks, Dorian. Um, well, you have um, obviously the uh, current arrangements that are um, that have come out from the sixth carbon budget. Um, so um, we can forward look um, in respect of that, and we can forward look um, in respect of the uh, issues that are kind of come forward in the legally binding targets of the Environment Bill. Um, so we we understand where that mechanism is going to come from, um, certainly up until 2035, um, and on that political pressure, it's not going to decrease, it's only going to increase. Um, also, then the case that I was referring to earlier, which is, uh, our, um, well, we've got a couple of cases, um, but most significant was the, the one against Royal Dutch Shell, um, where we did have um, the, um, so I'm just reading the case report, um, a legal obligation um, that Shell had to reduce its CO2 emissions by 45% by the end of 2030. Um, so, you know, what we can see is that there is now um, a greater, not just a political um, will to do that, um, but we've obviously got uh, a greater involvement of campaign groups and third party organisations which are changing the political landscape in, in itself. So, um, so it, it's about trying to see what we can, uh, can do um, and how we can positively make those steps um, to future proof um, any uh, uh, decision that's going to, to come in and political interference. I think that we've got the benchmark now. I don't, it's not going to get any lower than this. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're already seeing um, a lot of central push um, out of central government um, to, to bring forward targets. Um, there was a lot of political discourse last year and discussion about it. Um, we're running in, up into COP26. Um, we had a lot of discussion around it with G7 as well. So 
um, it, it, you know, the political interference um, together with um, more of a, a, a corporate overreach in terms of uh, ESG um, and funding initiatives, it's, it's only going to sort of become more intense, um, as it were. Thank you, Claire. Uh, next question is one to open up to the to the to the panel, and I'll take um, uh, speakers as as they come. Uh, do the speakers have any advice or experience on developing or perhaps even purchasing systems for monitoring outcomes and outputs uh, to assess either the impact of my current manufacturing operations or the changes I might make to try and increase um, sustainability and environment or reduce environmental impact? Who'd like to start? Um, I, I could uh, talk about that, Darren. Um, Thank you. Fantastic. From from a from a design point of view and a manufacturing point of view, I think um, life cycle assessment tools uh, have a significant role to play. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with with LCA, but uh, it's a process where you can quantify the impact of a product or process or service. Um, and then you can use that data to make informed decisions. So it's it's quantifying the impact across um, the whole life of a, of a product or service. So right from materials and uh, the, the production and processing of those uh, and through its use phase and its end of life phases. So what you can use once you've got that data and it's not a perfect system because there's, there's different systems and different approaches, but but um, it's the best we've got, I think, right now. Um, but what you can use it for is benchmarking against alternative approaches. So we use it for determining which is the best approach to take from an environmental point of view. But you can also use it to um, compare yourselves with competitors or to measure potential solutions against targets. Um, so I think as a, that's a, a useful tool. And I think there are sector specific things emerging. So there's um, the Higgs index uses these sorts of techniques for um, clothing and apparel manufacturers. Um, so I think, yeah, that's uh, from what we do, they're, they're the key, that's a key tool, I think, that, that will find its way into other things like um, environmental product declarations in construction, I believe, and, and, and those kinds of things. But it, the, that's the basic tool, I think. Thank you. Um, any other speakers like to provide any insight around that? I'll take that as it. Uh, I think Graham may be on mute. Uh, yeah, thank you, pardon. That was Graham, good. yes, it'd be great to hear your Yeah, just, just, to, just to add to uh, to the last comment there, the, in the construction sector, the, the move for uh, manufacturing products is towards environment product declarations. Uh, EPDs, which will have measures on them on, on how sustainable and impactful they are in use as well as in production. So, uh, so th that data will be assessed and will need to be declared. Thank you, Graham. Right, um, with that, I'll move on to a question which perhaps takes a bit of a, a sector focus um, and, and whether um, sustainable manufacturing in general should be um, considered in different forms or different levels of importance for different industry sectors um, and how should this maybe develop or influence government strategy or in, uh, in turn um, corporate strategy who'd like to take that question would you like to come up oh, yes indeed thank you yeah that, that's a huge question um I think it, it, it's not so much a question of whether it should be or whether it will be. Uh, I think it's more of a question of whether it is already. Um, you know, we've got the um, the Made Smarter Review, sector deals, industry roadmaps, the Green Industrial Revolution uh, 10 point plan that, that uh, Claire mentioned earlier. And I, and I think if you go down the list of stuff that's included in those, you know, the sustainable manufacturing is at, at worst implicit in pretty much everything listed um, in, in some ways it's explicit um, now in, in terms of how much that's that's influencing and involved in policy I, I would say that it, it's it's clear to me that it's it's central to that policy um, whether 
there is sufficient um shall we say legislation and funding behind that policy yet is is not a question that i'm probably qualified to answer but um uh, that will be my take on it anyway thank you oh i can see mutes coming off yes who else has got anything to add please go ahead yeah i mean <clears throat> similar to paul's experience really that it, it there are some challenges which are across the board you know and need large amounts of effort because everybody uses electricity for example you know and storage of electricity or and that sort of thing so there are some sec, uh, challenges are so big that everybody needs to look at them and then there are specifics to some sectors which need specific answers and specific solutions and, and it's identifying those and we've got we're somewhere down that road already um but um you know are, have we identified what all the sector specific problems are going to be yet yeah, no i don't think so i think some things are emerging because the solutions aren't there yet so you know are we all going to fire on hydrogen or are we going to fire using a mixture of hydrogen and natural gas or is it going to be all electric and though the answer to those questions give, means you have different problems and different solutions and they they might be different in different sectors so they might be different in steel to glass and ceramics even though they seem to have the same problem they might actually have different solutions so it's it's a it's a yet to be seen answer i'm afraid at the moment but but it needs an intelligent look at what the problems are that are emerging in order to guide it. Thank you. Um, I'm taking that as there's no more. The next question then, in, uh, uh, something which is close to my heart and others here in Sheffield is about um, heavy industrial users of energy, certainly amongst the heavy engineering and steel making um, population will be something which is very important to them. Uh, question is, we, we are a large user of energy and would love to be self-generating, but we've been told that the grid can't accept our energy back um, when, when we don't use it. How can businesses be or even contemplate getting to net zero if the grid system uh, can't take it, essentially? Uh, I think I've, I've, I'd expect quite a few people have got some comments on this. Who'd like to go first? Well, I'll just come in with something to start with, and I'm mm. sure there's a yeah, of course. Of fun on some of the other things. So I was just going to talk about the role of the uh, distribution network operators and and the, the role that they have really to try and support a, a network that is, is able to act in a more flexible way than has in the past. Um, I'm sorry about the dog, just decided at this moment to kick off again after being silent for last hour. Um, and uh, I guess there are things coming down the track around that. So they move from, this is a bit technical, but moving from being dis, um, distribution network operators to distribution service uh, organizations, which is meant to be promoting the role of um, DNOs as more flexible organizations that, that support a more flexible operation of the grid. Um, so, so I think they're a really critical part of this and they, they're a bit, because of the way they're regulating, the way they operate, they've been a little bit more rigid than we've needed them to be up till now, is, is my view. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on to others who might have some thoughts on other ways of, of dealing with that issue. Right, John, I think that's... Um, well, the, the network is going through a massive transition as we speak and the idea that how it is now is how we should plan our business into the future is is just a, the wrong position to place you know with the with the dis, with the highly uh, dispersed uh, solar and wind sort of expansion that is ongoing combined with the growth of some kind of energy storage be it hydrogen or batteries or a combination of of, of the two plus there are some other innovative sort of methods it's not just large bodies of water in mid Wales or whatever <laughs> that we can use to pump and and store there, there are other things coming online we have to look to the future and we we need to be really quite innovative here but you know maybe we could get a a little bit of a inspiration from the the power station just on the border between Sheffield and and, and Rotherham at Meadow Hall which has got some some very large batteries that are used for balancing its output and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And so, you know, rather than saying, no, we don't know what to do with the power when the grids, when, you know, when you're not using the power, the, the, the distribution network should be looking at that as like, wow, there you've got a massive hub of energy that we could store and use for balancing rather than buying nuclear power from France or or, or Scandinavia. And, and that has to change. But, and, you know, and I, well, 
I would like to say I was confident that our government was was you know had the foresight to do that as well as you know different methods of adding carbon to steel that isn't just coke you know using carbon dioxide for steel manufacture with hydrogen you know surely now is the time for some innovative uses on on those heavy industries that that have an opportunity i think there's a market for zero carbon steel or ultra low carbon steel across the world i can't believe that our government can't see that as as worthy of a punt yeah. with these amazing men and women working in our heavy industry around sheffield hallam i just it leaves me just breathless but you know that's probably just me i get breathless for all sorts of reasons um okay uh yeah shut up now thank you oh, thank you john yeah you and me both i think I, I, it never ceases to confound me sometimes but there we are uh, but anyway i'd like to offer any insight around that question on on trying to engage with the um, energy issues looks like we're done for today Okay, so this leaves me to wrap up. Uh, thank you for attending this seminar. Obviously, I am Mitchell, HSBC, and and our and um, a whole fantastically impressive host of academics from Sheffield Allen. It's been super interesting. I hope you all agree. Um, those questions we haven't got to. Hopefully, we've got your emails, and we will engage with you um, appropriately and try and answer your questions online. If you would like to. Uh, the slides and the video will be available for download or and or provision to you as a registered attendee. And once again, we'll thank you for attending and um, thank you very much. Bye bye.